Um, welcome. We're excited about this program. It's going to kick off and run for the next five or six weeks in that range, or maybe a little longer. Um, super excited about coming up, and I look forward to seeing you in a little smaller setting, a little more intimate. We can really go through a, uh, recipes. Today was meant to be a little bigger, so we're hoping some others will come in and join us. Can everybody hear me okay? Is it too loud? I really have trouble dialing it back, so it'll be uh, okay. We got two recipes today, and let's talk a little bit about life recipe and what Blue Cross uh, has. You know, we, we these guys have come down and basically come down to eat lunch about four or five times at the store. We, we cook them lunch, and they come down and we meet and discuss and lay out the plans for this. But the idea being is um, we embarked on a, uh, this journey together. Uh, Cooks has been working in this vein of Life Recipe, and you'll hear me refer to that, but Life Recipe is all about a program that is not about a diet. It's not about how to drastically slam change your, um, your eating or your cooking. It's just about small, sustainable steps, little changes that you think you want to take on, and then this whole series is about reinforcing those, giving you the tools, um, giving you, getting over those, any, any hesitations you might have or anything that's a challenge. So while we'll have content every week, I certainly encourage you to bring questions. What, you're, what are you struggling with in terms of ingredients, um, time blocks, whatever. And we can talk about all of that in any of these sessions. Today, we decided to do a quick Italian vegetable soup. And then also, and you'll get a little sample of that, so a little warm, uh, little warm bite today of the Italian vegetable soup. And then I'm also going to do a quick pesto grilled chicken. And I know we're getting towards the end of our grill season. Um, I saw purple and blue bands in Dakota. So I know we can grill longer, but some of the grills give up a lot of heat. But you can always grill in a grill pan. That's what we're going to use in here today. Uh, so a little pesto marinated grilled chicken. So just a couple of quick hitting ideas that you can do. But if you look up here, nothing but fresh, right? Everything is fresh. And this is the big step we need to take. Now, there are times. Uh, Minnesota's got a great local, sustainable farm to us, farmers markets, really good structure. Middle of February, that local sustainable circle includes Northern California, right? So we get a little bit bigger uh, in the wintertime to get the, some of that fresh produce. But it is about um, when it's in season and when it's fresh, we ought, that's what we ought to be eating. It's not poor in any, it's not a poor choice at all in the middle of February to shop your freezer because they've made a lot of changes in how they freeze um, vegetables that really work in things. But you got to avoid the ones that include anything other than just the vegetables. None with the butter sauces, none with all the extra sodium sauces. You've got to read some labels. But they've gotten really good about putting just vegetables in the freezer too. So it's an excellent um, way to shop for uh, maybe you can't get the fresh or the fresh is just not as fresh as it needs to be, uh, then your freezer is a great next choice. This soup though is all about, I do have to bend my head down occasionally, uh, this soup is all about uh, quick vegetables. Nobody has as much time typically to do a seven hour soup, right? Seven hour soup's tough, might be good, but it's tough. Um, but something that's quick uh, everybody has a chance. And this particular soup is super quick. It only simmers for about 20, 25 minutes um, after all the vegetables are sauteed. So it's really pretty quick. We're going to start with a little olive oil. And I've already had a couple of questions about olive oil and what to use. So once I get this started, we'll come back and talk about olive oils a little bit and what you um, might want to consider using when you're cooking. So I'm putting a little olive oil in the bottom. And all you're really looking for, the amount is not as important as just a nice coat on the bottom. And I would ask that you typically preheat your pan before you put the oil in there. And the reason being is even the pan um, opens up just a little bit. The pores of the pan open up a little bit. And once you do that, if you add the oil at that point, it doesn't take as much oil in your cooking or fat in your cooking because the pores are open and it glazes over really quickly. We tend to put more than we need when the pan's cold because it's puddling and not moving. So that's why it always says preheat your pan. There is a good reason. It wasn't just somebody's ideal. Um, so into this right away, we're going to put um, four of our vegetables right off the bat. We're going to put uh, a carrot, a couple of stalks of celery, 
uh, a half a cup of onion, I believe is what your recipe says. Medium onion. Um, and then some zucchini. Now, when zucchini is no longer uh, easily available, a little winter squash will be just fine, diced up about the same size. It'll add a nice other flavor to this. We're going down an Italian path in terms of flavors. Um, so it'll have some fresh herbs as well, some thyme and some basil. So I'm going to drop these in there right away. If you're not here, can you hear that sizzle? It means my pan was hot enough and my oil was warm enough. If you throw it in there and you don't hear anything, it's going to soak up that oil a little bit because it's not warm enough. We want that little bit of sizzle right off the bat. Now I'm going to turn it up a little bit too. Also going to add in my carrot, some celery, and some zucchini. Green beans. So we get five vegetables before we ever really put any broth in there. And these are just nice, um, clean, trimmed uh, French green beans. We're going to do a little half inch cut on these, just so it'll fit nicely with the other pieces. And they all go in there together, same time right in the beginning. Now we're not going to cook them very long because I want them to have their texture and their shape whole when they get in the soup. We're not making a blended pureed stew. It's about a nice fresh something with texture. A little more challenging making the 300 servings and bringing them here today to keep all that texture in place, but we'll see how I did when you get a chance to eat it. So the reason we're sauteing these before we add the stock is I want to get a little bit of flavor on there. I want to get just a little. I'm not going to get a lot of color. I'm not going to add a lot of dark um, sauteed bits. Notice that sometimes when you're at home, you're cooking with onions, they go in first and you saw and you soft and you soft and you soft and then you add other things. In this case, um, they will over the course of the simmer soften up, but I do want them to hold their structure as well. So I got carrot, zucchini, celery, onion, green beans. Got a really nice colorful pot going, right? A lot of colors in there. And that is when you're trying to introduce vegetables, variety is important. Variety of color, variety of texture, that's what you want in your pot because you're really trying to make this appealing. So the next thing that goes in is garlic. And I don't care what the recipe says. If it says to throw the garlic in the hot oil first, you better be ready with everything else because that garlic will cook very quickly and burn very quickly. So it says a couple of, a couple of cloves of garlic. I'm going to mince those. I can smell my vegetable. Can you can smell the vegetables out there, front row anyway. We'll start nailing this to the smell of vision section right here. You have a question? Yeah, does this matter to mince the garlic or to put it in the question was, is it better to mince the garlic um, versus using a garlic press? Uh, my answer to that is it depends on what you're doing. A lot of people use a garlic press because they don't want to touch the garlic or it's sticky or it's go. Oh. This is magic of television. This is the magic of television. I'll ask you how your soup was when I get done with mine. <laughs> um, the garlic press tends to extrude and kind of bruise the garlic a little bit. But if you want it really finely minced, it's an acceptable way to do it. Fresh garlic has got a ton of benefits, health benefits as well. So the recipe reads, put it in there for about a minute until fragrant, right? And you'll know right away, you'll get this nice little wolf of garlic. Okay, now I'm ready for the next ingredient. So, I need a little bit of stock, ladies. I'm gonna come back and just take it out of the spigot. Gotta add my herbs first. You guys keep doing what you're doing. So it calls for a couple of tablespoons of basil. So take some nice fresh basil. You guys grow basil this summer pretty well? Not a good a year as usual for me. I had less, less luck this year than normal with uh, my basil production. I think it has something to do with summer not coming until July, but... Um, oh, I, I'll, I'll need a... I'll have to pull it back there. I need six cups. Yeah, but I'll come back and use this. Sure. Did it go out? Hello. 
to talk a little louder, as long as you're still getting your recording. Oh, you're getting enough? Okay. Let's see. So, time for a little fresh herb in this now. Uh, basil, and we're going to use thyme as well. Now, thyme, very fresh little sprig. Um, the easiest way to get the thyme off the stem is to drag it in the direction opposite of the way it grows. So if the leaves are pointing up, you go this direction, and I want uh, about a tablespoon. So I'm going to add that in there. If you don't use fresh thyme and you want to use dried thyme, cut it by half. Dried herbs, because they're dried and they're a little more compressed in their flavor, um, you want about half as much. If it's a fresh herb at a tablespoon, then you want about a half a tablespoon dried. So I'll add this in there. And then my basil. So, so far, there's nothing in here except for vegetables, herbs, right? Sounded like a good cup of soup. The basis for a great cup of soup, though, is going to be your stock. What are you going to use as your stock or your broth? If you're going to purchase stock or broth, my recommendation is always get something unsalted. 100% of the time, low sodium if you, if you can't get unsalted. Here's why. You can always add salt to it. You can always make it taste better. But if the recipe calls for reducing it by half, it does not reduce the salt by half. So if you buy a fully salted broth and reduce it by half, it's now a doubly salted broth. Not a good thing to use. It depends on what you're doing with it. Now, soups you typically don't reduce. Some do. If you cook for four or five hours, they do. This one wouldn't reduce a lot. So you could get away with a little bit uh, less adherence to that in this particular soup. But um, there is, it is important. Now, making your own stock is super quick, too. So I've got this to the point that my herbs are in, my garlic, and then my five vegetables that were in in the beginning. I'm going to add now the broth and I'm going to ask for I get two more of those it calls for six cups if you want to make your own stock super easy how many of you um, either cook a rotisserie chicken Kim um, or get a rotisserie chicken periodically yep they're, they're pretty good need to read your labels on those they are um, some of them contain way more salt and additives than others. One more, please. Uh, but the bones that are in those, when you got all your meat off of there, take those roasted chicken bones, throw them in a the freezer, in a Ziploc bag in the freezer. Take your little trimmings of your carrots and your onions, the ends that you didn't want to get too close without cutting your finger. Thank you, sir. That's full six cups in my soup. Now I'm going to add, uh, I'll come back to the stock. Now I'm going to add a little bit of diced tomato and some cannellini beans. Now, cannellini beans, these are canned. Um, if you want to do your own from dry, that's excellent. You can add any bean you want, but cannellini bean is an Italian kidney bean, so it's more traditionally done in this kind of soup. By adding this bean, you've actually now really kicked up the protein that's in there. It's a lean plant-based protein. It's got a little fiber in there. Um, but now you've gotten this to the point that you've really packed this soup full of a bunch of vegetables. So I'm going to cut this. I'm going to cover it and let it come to a simmer. And then you would go about 20, 25 minutes and you end up with what you guys have with a little bit of uh, fresh parmesan over the top. How was your soup? All right, let's back up and talk about, finish talking about the stock. Um, the stock, we got those rotisserie chicken bones that are going in the freezer bag, uh, little ends of carrots going in the bag, little pieces of onion, celery, you know, when you take all the outside pieces of the celery off and there's the small stuff in the center with all the leaves, chunk that in that bag. Parsley stems, when we put a little fresh parsley in something, the lower half of the stem that you're not going to eat, throw it in that bag. When the bag gets full, dump it in the stock pot, fill it with water. If it's got chicken bones in it, go about four hours, strain everything off, and you'll have luscious chicken stock. If it's just vegetables, if you just want to make a vegetable stock, only got to cook it about 45 minutes. The one addition I would have to the carrot, the onion, the celery, the parsley stems is if you like mushrooms 
and you're busy cleaning your mushrooms every once in a while, your mushroom stems that you often discard, great for that bag, and you'll get a lot of that nice dark mushroom flavor in your stock. It won't be a mushroom stock, it won't be overpowering, but you'll get a really nice rounded flavor um, of that stock. Now, I had a question the other day, what's the difference between chicken broth and chicken stock? Chicken broth is um, the water that is used in cooking chicken meat, whole meat. Um, it's like you put a whole chicken and uh, boiled it, or you poached chicken breast for chicken salad. That liquid is chicken broth. Chicken stock is um, only formed when you use bones as the basis for the flavor. Now the difference is that bone has a lot of good things that come out in the stock process, right? You get some collagen, you get some of the flavor of the roasted bones, you get a little bit of the, all that goodness that's in that chicken bone really comes into the stock and that's what gives it that rich flavor. If you're talking about using it for a sauce or for thickening, uh, broth is very difficult to thicken on its own. There's no collagen in it. It's just the cooked chicken. Whereas a stock, that collagen has come out of the bones and it really makes for this nice luscious thick. Think your gravy on Thanksgiving. I know we don't have gravy every day and part of this is taking small steps away from things that we don't, um, don't need to have. But when you make it, you want it to be fabulous. And using a stock, especially a stock maybe you made yourself, will result in that really good flavor. Now, the broth that was used on yours was a chicken, uh, chicken stock uh, that was made with, um, uh, with raw chicken bones, not rotisserie chicken. It's, it's what I had, because I had to make five gallons of it. So uh, it was easier to do that than to go hunt down that many carcasses of rotisserie chicken. <laughs> You want this to simmer though, not, uh, not boil away, because I'm trying to protect the integrity of those vegetables, right? When you got your carrot, was your carrot still have structure? I mean, you still had a little to the tooth? Super important that it's not all cooked to mush, right? If it's all cooked to mush, then it's kind of something else. I will tell you this soup is excellent frozen and reheated, or refrigerated and reheated, but the vegetables just get softer the, long, the number of times that that happens. As it goes from cool to hot, the vegetables tend to break down, specifically the squash starts to break down its piece. So, soup. Any questions about the soup or anything we did to get there? Cool. Let's talk chicken. So for our pesto marinated chicken, now you would finish that um, with a little Parmesan cheese as you had on top of yours, not the stuff in the green can, right? That's not really cheese, okay? <laughs> Get a piece of cheese. I'll show you how the soup should finish. We'll go ahead and, even though mine has not simmered enough, right? The vegetables are not soft enough, we'll plate it out. But, scoop. It's a beautiful bright bowl of soup. It's got nice bright colors in there. Hunk of Parmesan cheese will last for a long time. It's a harder cheese. Little microplane, put your cheese on top. You can also use a box grater and get a really fine crumbled, but you don't want, the problem with that green can is um, it may have been cheese at one point, but to keep it from clumping together, they've had to add stuff, right? To keep it from not being just a solid ball. And we don't want any, I don't need anything added to my cheese so it makes it better cheese. I just want the cheese. And so a microplane is a way to just keep a hunk in the refrigerator. I have a bunch of little one inch hunks, you know, and you just come out and grate a little bit, wrap it back up and put it back in there. It will keep for a very long time. Um, a softer cheese, you'll need a bigger grater. You'll need a bigger hole on your grater to get that done. Are you guys still so okay. If you haven't had soup, just make sure they know it and they'll bring you some. It was delicious. Awesome. Okay, so chicken. Uh, quick pesto marinade. Now, if you were growing basil or you're buying basil, because basil's still coming a little bit. Anybody make pesto on a regular basis? Yeah. Do you freeze it? 
I try to freeze some so that in the middle of February when I can't see anything green, I can pull out a little couple tablespoons of pesto, remember what summer tasted like, and put it right in something. And that is the, one of the beauties about because some people say, I get all these herbs. What do I do with all of them? I only needed three tablespoons for the recipe, and six tablespoons come in the package. I don't want to waste it all. You've got to think of ways to preserve them. Now, I will also say that you can put fresh herbs in about any dish you're making, whether it calls for it or not. Just add a little bit of the fresh herbs. Thyme um, is one that's particularly well, too. When you've used all that you can and you feel like, okay, it's going to go bad, hang it up and let it dry. Or lay it out on the counter and let it dry. Pull off the thyme leaves, and now you have fresh dried thyme. The little dried spices that are pre-ground that are in your kitchen cabinet, circa 1990, you can throw them all away. The shelf life on pre-ground spices is about six months, tops. Yeah, so you all know you have something you need to go out. Yeah, I tried to throw my mom's away and I thought she was going to cut my hand off, so. She just still has some from the year I was born, I believe. Um, anyway, so that stuff doesn't have any flavor anymore, because if you smell a new one versus an old one. The other thing is whole seed. If you have something that comes in a whole seed form, buy the whole seed form, and then just take a coffee grinder that's specifically for spices and then when you need those you can grind them yourself. Think like cumin, uh, coriander seed, um, even fennel seed if you're using any of those things and if they all sound foreign then never mind. But the idea being does whole seed stuff ground is a way more um, intense flavor and it's fresher because the essential oils are protected a little bit because of the outside uh, container of the seed itself. So this pesto grilled chicken, um, it's not a full on pesto. If you read the recipe, it's like it's not quite, doesn't have pine nuts in it. Um, and that's because of what we're going to do with it. The other thing is pine nuts are like gold. And if you're trying to make these small sustainable changes and budget is a concern, pine nuts are super expensive. But we are going to start with um, a little bit of marinade, a little quick marinade. And it takes a half a cup of fresh basil. It's not critical half a cup is you know what you eyeball a half a cup to be um, you don't have to I've had somebody say as a get a measuring cup until they got comfortable and just pack it all in there and that's fine but once you get comfortable it's not that exact so just grab a nice big handful of bunch to that I'm gonna add um, some olive oil in a second a couple of cloves of garlic now even though it doesn't say whenever I'm putting garlic in a food processor I like to help the processor a little bit I don't want a big slab of garlic to end up in whatever I'm doing because somebody might really take a bite and not, uh, it won't be pleasant. So I don't need to cut it as fine as I did before, but I do like to get it down to smaller pieces, even if it's going in a processor, just because it'll tend then to be smaller pieces when we're done. The processor doesn't have to work quite as hard. All right, so two cloves of garlic. And a little bit of red wine vinegar. And then we're going to add some parsley. Now, I was talking about parsley earlier. Take a few, about half of this. I need about two tablespoons of parsley. Now, this actually is in my, um, you'll see it in the pesto recipe always. When you make pesto, do you use parsley in yours? Um, the advantage that I think parsley adds, basil is a very soft herb. It will bruise. If you ever cut it up and then it's, you cut it up too early, come back to it and it's turned black, it oxidizes. It's not bad. It's just changed color. If you ever looked at jarred pesto in the store, it looks like something that's in a military ration, right? It's that olive, deep olive green. It's not a bright green color. And that difference is just its oxidation. But putting parsley in your pesto tends to add that bright green pop. It brings it right back and it holds that bright green pop so it makes for, it doesn't add a tremendous amount of flavor, but it does add that nice bright green color. And we already know that if it is eye appealing, I'm more likely to take a bite. And then if it has a nice aroma, I'm more likely to take a bite. Now it doesn't mean you can get away with good looking, good smelling, bad tasting food, but if they're trying something new for the first time, they might want to see it, smell it, and then be excited about getting in there with it. So, parsley, like cilantro, top one third or so of the stems, um, totally edible, soft and enough to use. Bottom two thirds, a little woody, right? So if you're gonna pull the leaves off, how many of you do this? 
right? It's a much easier way, especially if you have a lot to do. Sharp knife and just shave it. You might have to pull a few stems out, but you won't have to pull out anywhere near as many as you did if you just tried to chop it. So just a couple of stems left. Now, what's left of this? Where does it go? In your stock bag in the freezer. And you've already got your parsley done. You don't have to buy parsley to make stock. You're using, you're recycling your vegetables. That's what you're doing. Your carrot ends, your onion ends, your celery ends, the center of that celery that you can't dip into peanut butter anyway, right? That part with the leaves on it, all of that makes for great stock. I don't have a stock bag today, so we'll just set it right there. And so I wanted about two tablespoons of parsley. That looks like about four tablespoons. I'm going to drop that in there. So I've got parsley and basil and garlic and red wine vinegar. I need a little bit of salt, about a half a teaspoon, and then about a half a cup of olive oil. So back to this olive oil thing. We talked about olive oil earlier on, but we didn't, I haven't come back and really talked about it in full. Extra virgin, cold press, first press olive oil, usually nice and dark green vegetal, right? Is this what most of you are using? If you're using olive oil? Great on salads, great drizzled on vegetables, great on though for making dressings. However, cooking with extra virgin, cold press, first press, all of those tends to be, um, it's not what I choose. Not because it's bad for you, and I know there's been some some uh, articles about superheating olive oil and it breaks down and releases stuff, but if you really have your oil that hot, uh, that's the problem, not the oil. You shouldn't be smoking this. You shouldn't get to the point that this smokes, but this smokes lower than the pure olive oil, and that's what this is. Now, pure olive oil is typically labeled that. It says 100% pure olive oil. It's kind of a misnomer, but that's what it says on there. And you can tell it's more yellow than the extra virgin first press, cold press, vegetal stuff, right? It's a little more yellow, looks a little more like canola. But the reason that you might want to consider cooking in it is it is, uh, has a higher smoke point, which means we're not going to generate that smoke at the same temperature. It has the same health benefits in terms of its structure. Now, there is something in the Mediterranean diet. Anybody reading anything about the Mediterranean diet? They're saying we all ought to drink about a quart of extra virgin olive oil a day. Maybe one day. I don't think anybody over on this side of the water is ready to drink a quart of olive oil a day. But there is something to that. And they talk about specifically extra virgin um, first press or cold press olive oil. But for now, the cooking part of it, I tend to choose pure. But it's a purely economic thing. Extra virgin cold press, first press olive oils, eye level in the grocery store. A little pricey. Pure olive oil, it's on the bottom shelf. About a third of the cost of extra virgin cold press, first press olive oil. So economically, if I'm going to cook with it and I lose everything that's in here in the first wisp of smoke, right, when I add this there, all this green vegetable stuff is going to burn out in that first wisp of smoke. Everything I paid extra for in terms of flavor is gone. So I might as well have a little more room on my smoke point and cook in pure olive oil. Now you can choose canola as well, or anybody using grapeseed oil? Grapeseed oil is a great oil, but it costs more than extra virgin first press olive oil. But it's a very neutral tasting oil, fabulous for you. It's got great health benefits and a really high smoke point. But you can't make the economic argument there with grapeseed oil. But it is a nice neutral tasting oil. So between those two oils, just about everything you need is something that you can cook with, either canola, grapeseed, or pure olive oil, and then extra virgin, a really flavorful one. Now, People often ask me, why are there so many different extra virgin olive oils? Let's we'll see how much time we had. Um, why are there so many of those? And it is because from different countries, as you can imagine, I'm putting a half a cup of oil in here, this is a, holds a cup and a half. From different countries, it's just like wine. It grows in different dirt. It has different amount of sunshine. It's got different amount of water. So olive oils taste different. Olives taste different. So when you're in a country, um, for me, Spanish olive oils are particularly peppery. You know, French olive oils are a little more buttery. 
uh, I would encourage you to go taste some and find the one. You don't have to like them all. You don't have to have 15 in your cabinet. Just find one or two that you really like, and those are the ones you ought to have um, in your pantry so that you can make salad dressing. I am a, a recovering engineer. About 50, uh, I have to go up every time. About eight years clear of pocket protectors and scientific calculators, but I still have spreadsheets. So uh, it's my comfort zone. But in that process, I went to culinary school that cost three times as much as my engineering degree, and that was a really hard pill to swallow, but I decided I would never, ever, ever again buy a bottled dressing. Vinaigrettes are super easy, right? And we'll do some vinaigrettes over the next several weeks. Um, creamy dressings were a little more challenged. Found the secret ingredient is non-fat Greek yogurt. Mm, we'll play with that a little bit too. Super approachable for creamy dressings. But because of that, I had to stock my pantry a little different. I had to pick a few oils that I really wanted to use, not 15, just a few, and vinegars that you really like. So those are some of the topics we're going to touch on as we talk about going forward is the things that you ought to include in your pantry. Okay, so I'm going to dump this marinade, and I had one some there, over the chicken. And I'm going to use the same container. Now you can do this in a uh, blender or a food processor, or if you're really a glutton for punishment by hand, take your knife, beat everything up really small, stir it into the oil, you can do that as well. But the idea is I want this nice uh, pureed marinade. Now when you get ready to grill it, I checked too, there's no sprinklers right over my head, I don't know about you guys. <laughs> but I'm not going to get wet. We won't go too long because I don't want anybody to come get me. When you pull this out, now obviously you let it marinate from 30 minutes up to about two hours. Chicken doesn't need to marinate overnight. I don't care what the recipe says. Um, if it's a high acid recipe, that chicken's going to start cooking, right? And that acid will start cooking it. Chicken, mm, no more than four. Fish, no more than an hour. It's really all it takes. Wouldn't be any fun without a little smell, would it? I'm turning it off. Well, easy. All right, so marinade done. Now to top our chicken, we want a little bit of uh, pesto on top too. And this is where you can pull some out of your freezer or uh, make a fresh batch. So I'm going to start with about a quarter cup of basil. Again, not an exact measurement. But everything that was in there except for the red wine vinegar is going to end up in my pesto. So there's no problem using the same container. My wife tells me that I'm busy out trying to teach fast for the family cooking. She told me I can't dirty 14 bowls and 7 pans. I have to try to find ways to keep it down to a manageable level so you can do your own dishes while you're cooking. So we're going to use the same container over again. Um, only one clove of garlic this time. We'll do our same thing. We'll break down into a little bit smaller pieces. Help the food processor out a little bit. So we have basil. We want two tablespoons of Parmesan cheese, not from the green can. Now, if you're going to make basil to freeze, a um, couple of schools of thought. I don't always put cheese in it when I'm going to freeze it um, because sometimes the cheese, when it freezes and then thaws, water things change. You know, it gets a little bit different watery texture when that comes out. It's not a bad thing, but if you don't want that texture, you can stir your cheese when it comes out. The other thing I don't do is I typically don't salt it when I'm putting it in the freezer either because I might pull it out and throw it into another dish and use it as an additive flavor and I don't want to be adding salt unless I know what that end use dish is and I don't always know when I got it in the freezer where I'm going to use it. So I tend to leave those two things out. Um, cheese, garlic, basil. Now they've got to have a little bit of uh, parsley again. Where's my little pile that I had left over? A little bit of parsley. A couple of tablespoons of olive oil. Now here, pesto, it's not going to get cooked, right? It's not going to get sautéed. It might get cooked in a broth. Use the good stuff. Use the stuff that you like the flavor of. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Very technical measurements there. 
about two tablespoons is what you're after. You are looking for texture on this. If you don't have quite enough in there the first time, you put a little bit more, but you're trying to get to that nice um, pasty texture for pesto. All right, so I got basil, parmesan, parsley, olive oil, clover, garlic. How about a pinch of salt? A little bit of pepper. Pepper's your own choice, as much as you'd like. I did, I've often, I'm not from the Midwest. I'm from a little further south. When I first met my wife, who's from North Dakota, she said, uh, where are you from? And I said, the south. And she said, Iowa. I said, no. <laughs> that is south, but it's a little further south. And my idea of heat, and a lot of ideas of heat up here are a little different. I have heard that ketchup is spicy in some places in Minnesota. But it got topped because somebody told me in North Dakota they didn't have salt and pepper in their house because, ooh, it's too spicy. So, a little crack of black pepper to your own choice. If you want to spice it up, totally do that. Spice is a great way to add a lot of flavor when we're trying to cut back on the things that we have traditionally relied on, like a lot of salt, a lot of sugar, or a lot of fat. Spice is a great way. It doesn't have to be hot, but you think fresh herbs, think other spices that are in your cabinets, that is the way to add some more flavor back. So, this texture as composed, you saw the marinade was, was liquidy, and in this case, our texture is much more like a paste. And you just spoon some over our grilled chicken. I uh, magic a TV again, because I didn't think I would get this fully cooked in here because of our friends and sprinklers. But this uh, grill pan is a great way to continue grilling in the winter. I don't usually have any problems standing outside grilling. It's when it gets to the point you're giving up 50 degrees, your grill can't often overcome that. And so everything cooks a little cooler. The whole purpose of cooking on the grill, high heat and quick, right? And so when you're giving up 50 degrees, it's a little tougher. Now, some of the ceramic grills, if you have a ceramic grill, those uh, tend to protect the heat a lot better. But I found as soon as I came to Minnesota and was looking to grill something in February that a grill pan was a great choice. Um, it's cast iron. Lodge makes one. This is a Le Creuset. They make one. But it's a way to get really nice grilled flavor in the time of year that you may not be able to get to the grill. It goes from the top to the oven. Uh, it even has a press that has the same grill marks if you want to do paninis and that kind of thing. But the idea being you don't have to give up on that cooking method just because the weather's not cooperating. And um, we like grilled stuff. We like it because it tends to be a little lower in fat, right? We may have put a little fat on it, but grill allows it to um, heat right on the surface of there, but the oil, it's not sitting in oil like you would for a pan saute. So we got our lovely grilled chicken with pesto. We've had an Italian soup questions about anything that we've talked about today or something that, ooh, I'm right on the money too, 11.45. Questions? Wow. No questions? Great question. I did forget that. Thanks, Kim. Um, she, the question was, can you, I'm ready to move the soup to the middle of the plate. That's what I'm going to have for dinner. Can I put some other, uh, another protein in there? We have cannellini beans in it. That's our lean plant-based protein. You can add rotisserie chicken. You can add, there's a lot of chicken sausages out there, you know, that are a lot lower in fat than traditional sausage, like a chicken Italian sausage or a turkey Italian sausage. Those do really nicely in here. Um, brown those up, and they can go right in the soup to beef it up is the wrong word, but to add a little more um, center of the plate to it. It's also, if you notice, there's no pasta in there, there's no rice in there. If you want to make it go a little more filling or stretch a little further, do a little orzo, a little whole wheat uh, elbow macaroni, or something like that. Um, how many of you are using whole wheat pastas now at all? A little bit? It was a tough battle, wasn't it, in the beginning? Some of that stuff was not really good, but I think it's gotten better. I think the whole wheat pastas are better. So if you haven't tried it in a while, you might go back and try it again. I often find myself using 50-50. I'll use some of both. You gotta play with your cooking times though and make sure that works out. Um, but uh, whole wheat pastas, and if you got gluten uh, concerns that you're, that you're paying attention to your gluten, uh, some of the best uh, non our best gluten-free pastas that I have found that hold up are either quinoa-based pastas 
or brown rice pastas. Those two tend to hold up pretty well. I will tell you with the gluten-free stuff though, it doesn't tend to do very well cooked, cooled, and reheated. The reason being, gluten is the glue in the structure that holds pasta together. And without gluten, you're using a blend of other flours, and it's really tough for that texture to hold together. So, um, but don't give up on the whole wheat pasta. It really is a good thing. Now, you could also put a little quinoa in there. You may play around with quinoa at all. Okay, we're going to come play with quinoa at one of our dinners. You'll, you'll get a chance, and I can make it so it's, if you don't think it's edible, um, come give it a try. Because uh, quinoa is all about cooking in the right liquid. It doesn't have a whole lot of flavor, a little nutty flavor on its own. You can't, it cooks easier than rice, but you just can't add water and cook in my opinion. I don't think that it comes out as well. You need to add a little liquid. So we'll play around with that too. But quinoa in that soup, a little barley in that soup. So any of those whole grains you could add to that soup and then make it a little stretch a little further and also be a little more filling. Any more? The question was, did I, do I ever cook with coconut oil or sunflower seed oil? Yes, I do. Coconut oil, and here's the thing. I, 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 just, I share the stage a lot of times when I'm talking for better for you cooking um, with, with a doctor, and um, he has a definitive opinion on coconut oil. Um, they're not all convinced yet that it's the as wonderful as some of the reports are. I mean, they're saying it's as wonderful. You can cook with everything and rub it on your elbows and your head, and everything is, is in better shape didn't work. Uh, but the, I think the jury's still out a little bit. It is a wonderful oil from a standpoint of it does seem to have some natural antioxidants and some really boosters, but it still has that coconut flavor. So if you're going to use it, I have to use it with things that will marry with that flavor. Um, a little, what's shrimp works great. Um, uh, you can do a coconut Asian flavored chicken that direction. Uh, it is if you're going to make your own nut butters. Peanut butter, I don't need anything added to. Almonds are a little drier, so a little bit of coconut oil to the almonds ground in the blender really makes for a nice nut butter. Um, but I would say stay tuned. I don't use it a tremendous amount. It's pretty expensive. Pint jar is about nine bucks, uh, typically. You get a big one at uh, Costco for 15 Then that's the kind you just want to rub all over you then, because it really is supposed to have benefits, even topically applied. Yep, I knew that was coming. They're going to try to figure out ways to get all of the coconut taste out of it. So, um, sunflower seed oil, I don't use much of, but it's got a great flavor. And I don't know where it is in the health benefits. It's not that bad compared to the others, but it is a nut oil. Nut oils, remember, they will go rancid. So if you're buying those and storing them for long periods of time before you use them, dark and cool is much better for those. So that, uh, same like you treat your wines and vinegars. So that wine rack that's sitting over top of your refrigerator, vibrating in the light all the time, not good for the wine. The olive oil that's stored, stored beside your cooking surface, like right here, mm -mm, all the heat variation tends to break that olive oil down. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be a short life, but don't be buying a four gallon container and think it'll last there next to the heat. Anybody else? Awesome, thank you so much for coming. I look forward to seeing you in one of the other sessions.